Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be hailing from. This is Red Hat Enterprise Linux Presents. I'm your host, Eric, the IT Guy Hendricks. And on today's episode 60, I'm joined by none other than the fantastic Nate Lager. Welcome back to uh, Real Presents, my friend. Fantastic. That's, this this changes the conversation about battle axes from the pre-show. <laughs> <laughs> battle axes and, and undead, all, all sorts of exciting things. We, we need a post-show. We, we need to... There, there's a community podcast that has a uh, has kind of a mumble room that they hang out in after after the recording's over. We need something like that because there's there's so many conversations that take place before and after we hit the go live button that yeah. are just are worth sharing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like like an outtakes or whatever post show. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so today, uh, today we we intentionally chose a bit of a clickbaity title because this is a fun and exciting conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, today we're going to be talking about image uh, deployment, uh, but in a little different way. Uh, so if you're at Red Hat Summit, you might recognize the, uh, the, the core of this talk. But uh, we, wanted to, we wanted to resurface this, this conversation here on RHEL Presents because I think it's, it, this, the, the technology that's been coming out, in particular with things like Image Builder and Ansible Automation Platform, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but I mean, the way that images are being built, the way that... Uh, images can be automated and distributed across multiple multiple platforms. One of my favorite topics right now. So we actually had uh, Nate. You actually helped co-present a presentation mm -hmm. at Summit. So I would like to uh, bring on our guests today, and I'd like you to uh, to do some introductions, maybe a little bit of background on on why you all picked this topic. So with that sure said, thing. I want to bring D uh, Justin and Alex on to Rel Presents. Welcome, gentlemen. Right. Thank you. So. Um, Thank you. Yeah, welcome, welcome, guys. So uh, Don't worry, you're well, not getting out of introductions. We'll, we'll yeah, what 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 was it, Justin? Like uh, eight months ago or whatever, you and I had a co presentation to do about Image Builder, and that that yep. spawned this whole concept that uh, we would go to Summit with this this idea that you had for the Rel Easy Button is what we were calling it. So, uh, Justin, you you, you want to give a quick intro as to who you are, and I don't know, maybe like how how this this came about. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, my name is Justin Lacey. I'm a RHEL Specialist Solution Architect at Red Hat. Um, and as far as how this whole conversation came about, it was really twofold. Uh, so we had the conversation about Image Builder. We realized that it could service a lot of needs for our customers, and we wanted to make sure that we could highlight that in detail. And to be fair, me and Alex had already been working on a conversation to help with helping our customers manage cloud spend. And so the two of these ideas kind of came together and that's really what created this presentation. Yep, and then Alex, I mean, uh, Justin brought you into the, the conversation for obvious reasons. You wanna tell us what those reasons are? <laughs> yeah, so as Justin mentioned, we had a conversation at Summit last year. So in 2022 on essentially using automation to reduce cloud spend. So basically finding ways to turn off stuff I'm not using on the weekends, which as you can imagine, Amazon and AWS and Google, they want you to spend that money, but it was our job to say, hey, how can we cut off? Let's turn off the dev and test instances Friday at 8 p.m., turn them back on Sunday at 8 p.m. in an automated fashion. And then kind of that next step was, well, how do we build those images, which conveniently led itself into the talk that we did this year at Summit really around all things automation. So I conveniently am an automation specialist. I've been doing Ansible for four years now. So I've been through the, the ups, the downs, all the changes. And I was lucky enough to you know, deploy 2.4 yesterday, with rolled out, which rolled out. So shameless plug, automation platform 2.4 is available with some cool things that I can also help with these different pieces. So definitely excited to be here and definitely good to talk to the, the larger RHEL audience. So uh, just uh, that doesn't quite exactly cover what you do at Red Hat other than just uh, Ansible stuff. What What's your title? What do you do? So I'm an Ansible automation specialist. So I've been, I cover the Southeast. So right now it's the, the North Carolina enterprise pods, but I've been doing everything about Ansible for four years. So everything from Linux automation to networking, to windows, to cloud, to really every variation of it. Um, I do have a public GitHub. I do have a YouTube channel. So conveniently enough, if you take my name, Alex Dorgen, and you put that with an at in front of it, that is my YouTube channel. Um, in theory, after this, I will actually be publishing another YouTube video around event-driven Ansible that just dropped with 2.4. So another shameless <laughs> nice. spoil for uh, things that are coming out. But again, it's all about 
how do I make automation easier and increase the number of things that can trigger it? So, hey, if I've got an event that came in that says, hey, we've got a CVE, well, I could trigger that to start and build using Image Builder, using Ansible to do the entire process. So that's the beauty of really having everything defined as code. I can now do that entire process using Ansible from building the, for, for an on-prem, building the RHEL 8 VM to have Image Builder on it, to setting up Image Builder, to actually doing the Image Build process. Start to finish, the entire process is automated. Mm, that's awesome. And that is actually what I'm hoping to do in my home lab, especially around, uh, especially around, I, I do a lot of demos and a lot of presentations that require going through the same steps over and over again. Things like uh, Image Builder, in-place upgrades, convert to RHEL. Uh, a lot of those tools fall in my purview as a technical marketer. And so being able to just tell my tell my AAP instance here, go and, and spin me up a, 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 a leap to, to RHEL 8 box and just sit back and then have all the commands, all the stuff pre-populated pre and just hands off. Scale that out to... I now have a hundred thousand servers and there's three sys admins. Cause that's seems to be how it always works. Uh, <laughs> and, and how do I manage this when I've got, when I've got a footprint in two different clouds, I've got maybe VMware in, in my private cloud. I got bare metal servers. I've got virtual machines. I've got developers who are trying to build this thing on their laptop. And it's just like the, it, the, the, just the, the, the just sheer, ridiculousness of that scale really really kind of just drains your energy when while you're thinking about it and uh so anyway before i derail us too far on on eric's soapbox <laughs> there <coughs> um you're not derailing us we're we're gonna be getting right into that question sooner rather than later yeah i mean fair, this, but, this uh, is exactly what automation is meant to help solve right because it teams are talk? always understaffed other than uh um, it, it's, it seems like no matter how many systems you have, you always have one or two, too few admins. <laughs> so I have a saying, which is that, uh, complexity grows like weeds, right? So this idea that you have so many different builds and so many different instances and having to keep track and manage all of that is a problem. And from all of the customers that I talk to every day, I find that problem just expands exponentially grows the larger your organization gets right so i, I actually think that our, our our first point that we were trying to cover we we kind of actually just danced around it just this whole multi-cloud hybrid cloud approach um it's it's funny when you don't read the the uh the show notes that that uh, that you write as a host uh, yeah <laughs> it's, it's not like we spent time writing them or anything why why would we read them <laughs> And use them as a guide, <laughs> but but the one thing that that uh, that you all observed for your summit presentation that really struck me as as interesting is we all remember a few years back, more than a few years now, where everybody was all in on cloud. We're moving everything to cloud. The cloud is the future. The cloud is the end all be all. The hardware market is dead. Um, of course, that's just the sheer ridiculousness of, of how our industry works. You make one statement and everything gets blown out of proportion. And uh, and that, that was true with the cloud market as well. But what we've actually been seeing through studies, through our partners, through anecdata, see what I did there? Anecdata? Um, from talking to customers, <laughs> a lot of those workloads are actually getting pulled back into the data center. So what, what, did, what did you guys see uh, to come up with, with, with that? So let me, let me say something real fast here. Um, I have been very much focused on things like FinOps, the idea that uh, managing cloud spend is extremely important. And what we found, or at least what I found from talking to several different customers, is that many of them have to deal with the fact that some workloads are just not cost efficient. So like, especially for like persistent workloads, things where services are handling a large volume of transactions, it can get prohibitively expensive very quickly. The other thing I would say as well is that many of our customers aren't necessarily pulling it back to on-prem. In some cases, they're just moving it from one cloud provider to another <coughs> cloud provider. And that requires a significant amount of rework. And we don't always know where we're gonna end up. So in some cases, you know, we have to build a process that we hopefully can do on multiple different providers because if we have to change direction, that might be the only solution. So Image Builder is fantastic. 
it fits this hole neatly. And we can leverage an automation tool like Ansible Automation Platform to solve this. So before before we dive into that, because I mean that's kind of the crux of our conversation. What what's driving the move from one cloud to another? Just different features, change in systems administrator preferences. What what's driving that that migration? So I will give you the number one mistake that most people make when they are choosing a platform and deploying it, which is that they are not the only ones in the conversation, right? Some cases, the technical leads are the only people that may be involved, but in most companies, there is a business aspect and business negotiations that can completely change the direction you were going. Or there may be additional requirements like security that may end up changing the direction you wanna go with your platform. So a lot of these things you won't know until you get into the thick of it, right? Until you start deploying, you won't see the evidence that leads you towards one path or the other. So you have to be very flexible early on. And again, back to our earlier statement, I'm very concerned about complexity. So I mm -hmm. wanted to find the simplest solution that I could. Yeah, and I'll say, as Justin said, for the business side, the number of times I find customers like, oh, we're gonna spin up stuff in Amazon and then realize that their business is an Amazon competitor and they need to very quickly <laughs> shift gears because, hey, everything needs to be in, in Azure now because we cannot deploy as a business things in the Amazon cloud. So it's adjusting, it's looking at, you know, what are those hosted services that exist in the different cloud providers? What provides the closest availability to our on-prem resources? There's a lot of nuance that goes into it. And, and in many cases, it does come down to dollars and cents. What is the cheapest mm -hmm. option that gives us the exact capabilities that we need with nothing more? Especially in today's economy, if we all look out, you know, if there's spec tech everywhere. That is the biggest thing is if you can't prove to me that there's a cost reason for this, I will find another way. And I think that's driving a lot of the cloud shifts and migrations back to on-prem. Yeah, when you're talking about hundreds or thousands of servers, right? Even a couple cents an hour matters, right? If one cloud provider offers the same instance, the same performance at a very slightly cheaper per hour or per minute or whatever rate, you know, that adds up quick. Yeah, yeah really and that does. was the, the one thing that we found for the, the turning off instances. If you turn off instances of 48 hours, that's two sevenths of your cloud bill gone. That is a huge, like two sevenths of anything is a massive number. So just right. think about that, like saving two sevenths of my cloud bill from one cloud provider to another as a very large change in how much and where those dollars and cents are going. So turning off your dev environment over the weekend or off hours can save you a ton of money. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, but if you think even, hey, I'm a US based company, I turn them off at 5 p.m., turn them back on 8 a.m. every day. That just adds right. up to the total amount of savings that I've got. Right. Yes, there's some nuance that we found out that went into it. If you have reserved instances, you may not be able to turn everything off because you may be paying for it anyway, but it still right. provides a massive savings that a lot of people just haven't thought of because, hey, I turn it on and I'll, I'll turn it off when I'm done. And that's not necessarily the best way to do it. Something I'd like to add, going back to Eric, your, your, your question, is that you may be able to move to the cloud but you may not be able to control the timeline for that, right? Mm -hmm. And some services kind of require to go hand in hand together. So if you are delayed on one particular project, it can impact your ability to deliver it. So it may be the case that sometimes you're just not ready from a organizational level, in which case, you know, you might have to move it back to on-prem or back to an environment where you know it works until it's ready to move. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about, too, is the fact that <laughs> we sometimes have to build multiple operating systems and managing different versions gets very complicated very quickly. So being able to build one image and then be able to deploy it everywhere gives you a lot of consistency you couldn't otherwise have. So well, I think that's. I think that's really where this this conversation kind of takes flight is you've you've got you've got tooling and you've got these concepts like infrastructure as code. You don't make any changes unless it's reproducible in a playbook. And then that, that really helps with this process. Whereas the first time you move to cloud, which only some people did a little bit, sort of. Um and whether you're coming back or you're going to focus on on-prem, you're going to you're going to build out all these different environments. 
the the beautiful place the the beautiful thing about using something like image builder is that you can actually abstract away those hypervisor layers those those cloud layers because image builder in the end isn't going to care whether you're de deploying on azure gcp bare metal qcow2 it doesn't matter because all the all the rel bits are going to be exactly the same the only difference is the output that you get you know it might be a qcow2 file for local local virtual machines it might be an iso for for bare metal installs it could be an ami for for aws it doesn't really matter in the end what you're building for and then you can tie it into something like ansible automation platform alex and we'll uh you can you can abstract that all away because maybe you have an application that's running in azure that needs to talk to active directory but maybe your maybe your application is very kubernetes adjacent and so it's running in gcp uh, I mean, there's there's just all these different use cases where you could have multiple clouds, but not have to manage multiple disparate infrastructures. <coughs> right. And for folks who maybe aren't familiar with Image Builder, although if they watch this show, they've seen Image Builder before. Um, there's, of course, the old way to get this done was Kickstart, right? We would use Kickstart for build automation and you'd build a new machine every time you wanted to deploy something based on your Kickstart. Well, uh, Kickstart got complex quick. And what is it, three decades <laughs> or so that that technology has <laughs> been around, uh, which, sh which shows how, extend how extensible and useful it really was to begin with, right? But you know, like Pixie environments with Kickstart and ISO images that do automated installs and whatever. But as Justin mentioned earlier, um, all that infrastructure gets complex and if you need to make slightly different builds, there's a hundred different ways to make those slightly different builds with Kickstart. Whereas Image Builder has sort of hit the reset button there. And now you can churn out an image based on a template, right? And you can have slightly different versions of the template, which are much easier to manage than slightly different Kickstart files or different ways to make your Kickstarts dynamic. Um, and they're not dependent on things like what hardware you're building against, right? Or at least not as dependent. I suppose there's probably, if you dig deep enough, there's some dependency here or there. But so, you know, important things to remember when you're thinking about, about uh, image mm -hmm. builder versus the sort of the old way. Because believe me, I, I ran a, an environment based on satellite with Kickstart and Pixie Boot and, you know, install images pulled right, right from Red Hat. And I mean, it made my life easier until there was a problem. Right. Until there was, why did the build fail? And then you spend half your day parsing through like console logs and whatever to figure out what went wrong. And, you know, it's it's because the underlying hardware on this server is slightly different than the underlying hardware on the last server you built. And, you know, the, the disk looks a little different or something. So, yeah, it's frustrating sometimes. <laughs> so you, you talk about Kickstart. Mm -hmm. Kickstart was was a walk in the park compared to my first job in in an IT department. One of my first jobs was to build and deploy Windows desktops using, I think it was owned by Symantec at the time, but using Symantec, it was either Symantec or it might have been Norton Ghost. Uh -huh. uh, but trying to figure out how to automate that nightmare, at least with Linux, you have things like bash scripts. Um, Windows, Ghost. not so much. Ghost was like the go-to oh. tool for imaging labs and stuff. When I worked in higher ed, that was mm -hmm. that's where it's where they were when I got there. And a lot of that evolved in the decade I spent in higher ed. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I understand exactly what you're talking about when you say Ghost it brings back all the memories. <laughs> See, that'd be a great conversation for for post show hangout. I'm I'm thinking yeah. we got to make this happen. Yeah, totally. So, um, so the question that uh, that Shantanu asked was, how would the target not matter? And I, I wanted to I wanted to address this uh, quickly because uh, I didn't want to confuse folks. Uh, so the init the init RDS and the drivers that are used, even some of the packages that are used between the different cloud providers, um, are actually baked into Image Builder. So when you when you say that I need an AMI, there's actually oops. There's actually a list of uh, packages uh, in the documentation that say if if you select an AMI, these packages get added. If you select GCP, this package gets removed and these two packages get added. So as far as the system administrator, uh, as far as the system administrator building out those image templates, the output doesn't matter because image builder is going to basically 
flavor give it give the image that flavor as it goes to build out the specific image that you're going to then deploy to your cloud provider so i wanted to address that uh, because that could be a bit confusing yeah and one of the things that Nate <laughs> talked about was like the number of images that exist i actually had a conversation yesterday with a customer about this was they were trying to figure out the image sprawl that existed they went so detailed with every image that existed where each application team essentially had their own image and good luck maintaining that and upgrading it and keeping it up to date. And essentially the, the shift is min build an image, build the pieces that are a pain to redo and then automate the rest. And as kind of Eric said, I can now have a definition of here's how I build it for this application team versus that application team versus this on-prem environment. And this has all kinds of benefits. A, if I need to migrate, to this cloud or to that cloud or to back on-prem, or everyone's worst case scenario is a ransomware attack. Someone hacks into my server and locks it down. Well, if I've backed up the data in an automated fashion, I can actually just kill that VM, rebuild it, restore the data, and I pay them $0. There's a whole lot of benefit for all of this, and even disaster recovery. I have a definition to rebuild my entire environment somewhere else. So it's obviously the, the benefits from the ease of maintenance side, but also all those worst case scenarios if I automated the process to build it everywhere, I can restore it anywhere that it needs to be with images that I've created for Azure, GCP, VMware, doesn't matter. I love the, the call out to the, I love the call out to ransomware, Alex, because so many people are unprepared for that sort of an attack and they end up paying money to criminals. And it's really a gamble as to whether you're really going to get what you really wanted out of that money or not. <laughs> They're criminals. They stole your data. <laughs> So one of the things that me and Nate spoke about last year, uh, and I think about this quite a bit, is the fact that a lot of cloud-provided images are typically not tuned for the application workflow yeah. that's going to run on it. And they yep. may not meet the security requirements. Like, you have to bolt it on after the fact. And there's certain things from a technical level that you could only do during the initial build of the system, which image builder helps you accomplish. Yeah, so things like partition tables are really the, in my mind, like that's the thing. That's the thing that's really, because most configuration you can do in post. And really the, the attraction to both image builder or cloud images are that you can churn them out quickly and easily and then use automation to finish the job, right? Well, there's certain things even automation can't solve. Things like, how is my disk laid out? How are the partition tables laid out? Things like that. That's really hard to change afterward. Yes, it can be changed afterward, but why change it afterward if you can build it into your image? And that's exactly what Image Builder solves, along, along with a you know, along with a few other things like system registration and you know, um, initial packages, right? And again, there's a, there's a couple ways to solve those problems, but the partition table is really the thing that gets me. And then also, you can make sure, hey, I've got an automation user that I want to leverage across all the systems bake that user in with the SSH key already in there so everything's ready to go. Yep. So when that kickstart happens or I reach out to the automation platform to do it, everything's ready to go. I can connect. I'm not setting up 15 other pieces to get ready. Yeah. I mean, it's a fantastic workflow because I use the image builder, uh, the RHEL image builder to define what my RHEL 9 standard image looks like here in my home lab. And then part of that image is an Ansible user with uh, with the correct sudoers permissions and an SSH key. And then it's really easy to just spin that rel nine image up anywhere and then use something like Ansible to then kind of add, add layers. If you think about it like a cake, uh, like a large wedding cake, you know, that, that bottom layer is the most general, the most basic rel image that you can get. And then you decide what flavors, what frosting, what decorations that you want on top of it, how many layers, um, and and I've 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 heard a rumor, Alex, that Ansible Automation Platform can actually help manage some of the image building process. So that is an accurate rumor, and this is one of the things that started rolling out in the 2.3 Automation Platform with what we call validated content. So I've seen some things pop in the chat. Of, I've never gotten Image Builder to work, and as I've thrown out there, I'm an Ansible guy. Have I ever used Image Builder before I went through this process for Summit? The answer is no. That's not my expertise. That's not what I do all. But I know very well how to leverage roles and stuff that someone else has built for Ansible. And fortunately, I've gone through that process and I can even show all these different pieces of what I've done. Because for me, 
proof is always in the pudding. I can talk about image builder all day. I can talk about, I can use Ansible for those pieces, but I actually have it running today. So what I've done is I have a standard rel eight image running. And because I like to make it more challenging for myself, I actually have it registered to Red Hat satellite. So it's not registered to, to the CDN, which I found out the hard way created new challenges that I wasn't prepared for. So I have just like a, running satellite in a home lab. Well, running satellite in a home lab, yeah, which has its own challenges. But then realizing Image Builder <laughs> defaults to point to CDN, which this image didn't have mm -hmm. access to, so it caused all kinds of fun. So I went through the entire process of figuring all of that out. So right now, I don't have Image Builder installed. I don't have Cockpit installed. I have nothing set up other than a rel8 image running 8.8 .8 and the base OS and AppStream repos. That's it. Nothing, nothing fancy because, again, I don't know what else needs to be there. I've never done Image Builder. I don't know what package they're installed. Fortunately, someone else does. And if you know the story of Ansible and how I talk about things, I beg, borrow, and steal Ansible code collections from those that know these things better than I do. And that's kind of where the beauty of Ansible comes in. So I obviously I'm leveraging the automation platform. I do have two job templates conveniently created one for building the actual image and then one for setting up image builder. So as I said, I do not have image builder up and running. So I probably need to set it up first. Um, very simple job template that exists. It really is just, you know, pulling from one playbook that I will walk through here momentarily. And it has obviously my credentials, which conveniently is my Linux service account that I may have set up using image builder. Um, and all this is going to run is on, I've got a limit set to run on the single host that exists. I was very creative in my naming conventions. I called it image.shadowman.dev. And I'm going to launch it. That's it. I'm not asking any questions. I don't need to know what the playbook is. I figured all these pieces out. Obviously, I'm not going to lie to you and say I'm not going to walk through the playbook because there is a playbook that exists that does that. This is my playbook. This looks really simple from a you know user endpoint standpoint. I am using validated content for the actual setup of the server. So this is doing all the cockpit install, all those pieces. And then these are the pieces that I found out as I was going through this that I wanted to add in. So I needed to set up the satellite pieces because if you've dug through the image builder documentation, there's a specific place that the JSON files for setting up the repositories to point to satellite goes for it to work in image builder. And I figured I can automate that process. So I did. And then also, because I like to be nice, I like SSL certs. So I added in SSL certs for a cockpit. And this, this also creates an Apache server to host the image at the end of the day. So I went through that process. It was not complicated. It's if, you, if, you, if you've ever dug through the image builder docs, you probably recognize that folder. It's where it tells you to put those things. And I leverage templates to figure out the OS release. So Every time I stand up a new RHEL server, so whether I'm standing up RHEL 8.6, 8.7, 8.8, I'm using Ansible Facts to take advantage of that, copying in the cert specifically that ties my satellite so it works, because I found that was another problem. Deleted the, the cert that exists for um, the content delivery network because I'm not collecting to that. And then I restart everything. That's it. Now when I pull up Image Builder, and you'll see this once that's done, it will have the repositories for satellite not for the content delivery network, which would break because my environment doesn't have access to it. So especially if you are in a completely segregated environment, everything you do pulls from satellite and automate that process too. The SSL certs, nothing complicated. I'm just throwing in certs in different places, whether it's you know for cockpit or for Apache, nothing complicated to get that going. But it's just a playbook running, setting all those pieces up. I've done nothing. I have not manually logged into that server. I don't have to do those steps. And I will admit, when I started this, I didn't even know what packages were needed to set up cockpit and needed to set up image builder. And that's the beauty of something like validated content, which is what we provide. So validated content is something that the, the automation team put together. There's all kinds of stuff, whether it's AWS, whether it's Azure, or there's a collection for managing OS build. Convenient. That's exactly what I wanted to do. And going into this, when you know Justin reached out and asked, I did not know a single thing about doing this process. But there are conveniently, I'm going to ignore modules because I'm lazy. There are roles, one for setup server and one for builder. That's exactly what I want to do. So I took those roles because generally I'm, again, lazy. This is the process for setting up the server. And I'll walk through builder in a little bit. This is it. Simple role that I need to call, which is exactly what my playbook does. And then obviously I added in the nuances to handle an on-prem satellite but it was not a complicated process to get us all up and running because 
I'm leveraging the expertise of someone else. So whether it's Nate's ability to understand Image Builder much better than I do, or Justin's understanding of RHEL, uh, I'll take advantage of that every day. And in theory, this is finishing the process where it's restarting, so I can see it's doing that sim link. So when I pull this up, it actually will have the uh, correct repos for Image Builder. I know this takes about four minutes, so conveniently, it's not too difficult. But the one thing I talked about before was, well, do I really need this server to live 24 seven, this image building server? Well, as I talked about with the cloud stuff, I don't need this to run. I'm wasting energy in my on-prem environment or my cloud environment if I'm using it there. I've automated the process to build this server. I just add this job template in and my job template to build the image and that's it. Now I can schedule this in control to run every week, every month or on demand to rebuild my images, push them to Azure or to vCenter and then destroy it. So, so it the, may be the, for an hour. The key there, if I understand you correctly, is not only do you not need it to run, you don't need it to exist. It doesn't even need to be taking up space on your cloud provider. It's not even a disk image at this point. It's, it's a definition that you can churn up in four minutes to then start making images with. Right. Yeah, so the actual the provisioning of RHEL take, may take a little bit longer, but we're spinning up. But this process to actually take a blank RHEL 8 image and set up image build. So this is cockpit with SSL certs with image builder, because obviously I'm not going to lie about that, because that is a key part of what we're trying to demonstrate today. But all this exists with, because I don't want to be a liar. If you notice, that source is my yep. satellite. That's the key process of what I did not have before and why everything broke. The app stream and base OS are my satellite in my environment to pull from that. And everything is set up so it will pull from there. So all my automation in a completely disconnected environment will work. So a, a big add on that I did not know when I got into this process, but it simplified a lot. So now I've got everything up and running. I've got a RHEL 8 image. I could even make sure that the RHEL 8 image is patched before I do this, because all that goes into my automation process with one job template, one workflow to really stitch everything together and then auto deprovision really handle that full process so things don't live, you know, after the process. And then mm, the next step, love it. the next step is obviously building it. So I know, again, I was not an image builder expert. I had not played around in the UI at all, which has changed a lot since I actually did this demonstration uh, for Summit with the new 8.8 version. There are a whole bunch of options, you know, as we talked about SSH keys and users and setting up suitors rules and all that. Wouldn't there be an easier way? Can I codify this as well? Of course there is. So because you know everything in Ansible can be templatized, I can create a single playbook that does this process for me. And I like variables. So I've got my public key conveniently stored as a credential in AAP. I've variabilized the compose types because as Eric said, no, maybe today I want it to be an Azure image. Tomorrow I want it to be for vCenter. The next day I need a QCAP whatever it is i provided that out and because i like surveys and limiting what i don't want people to build i don't have aws images because i don't use aws today for whatever reason it gives you that capability and you know, here are the packages i want to add in i can modify this but every single component like file systems open scap profiles all of that is part mm. of this process so every single thing and if you've ever jumped into the blueprints for os builder there are a lot of options it is never ending in terms of options that you can provide in there. So whether it's you know going through this and figure out what the image looks like, or if you want to be nice to yourself and have a UI, everything that's in here, I can then turn into a variable here that gets added into that overall blueprint, because that's the name of it, creates a blueprint. And even with Image Builder, once I do this and run it, that blueprint becomes available for me to look at through the cockpit UI, and I can see what it built like. So maybe day one, you know, I want to go through these and figure out you know all the things that I want to build through the UI take that blueprint. Now I can just go back, work backwards, create this definition. And now I have a version control history of what my blueprints look like. So if security two weeks from now asks, how did you build this image? Here's my definition in version control in my Git history. So it definitely makes this process a lot, a lot easier. And again, I variabilize as much as possible. So I've got four actual variables that I do when I run this survey. Because sometimes it's, you know, as simple and I name my job templates easy to find with raw presents. So this is my build image, image builder job. And again, I've surveyed the image types. If you're not familiar, there are a lot of different image types that exist. In this case, I want to do VMware. I'm going to do VM and 
because I like to be lazy for my username for my image. I'm going to make an Ansible user because that's what I'm going to connect with it. And I'm going to put in some random password that you can't see. And then I'm going to launch it. That's it. That's all I need to do to start this image build process. It's going to template out that blueprint file. It'll go through the process of actually launching the creation of that image. All of that's handled behind the scenes. Also with this infra.os build role that's set up, also set up an Apache web server. So obviously through the UI, I can click download and all those pieces. This actually auto downloads it and push it to the Apache web server. So if I just want to pull that kickstart file or put pull that VMDK, there's now a hosted web server that has that available to you to make it easy to pull into a different environment that exists. So it's again, it's trying to find those challenges that may exist otherwise. And as you can see, things are running. So again, I like to prove this was blank. I've got an image. It started the creation process. It's got those four packages. I can export the blueprint. Everything's available to me. And I did absolutely nothing through the UI. So I know there are always those that say, I will never touch UI. I will be command line till the, the day I stop writing things for IT. A, there are obviously CLI commands that I can run, or I can just run Ansible for this whole piece. So I know this will take about 10 minutes, but yeah, go you've ahead. Just, you've just touched on one of the beauties of why Rails Web Console is not the old days of Linux GUIs, right? It used to be, if you managed a thing with a GUI, don't touch the command line because the GUI is now controlling those config files and whatever. The web console is not like that. And I like that you mentioned that earlier about having you, you, you define that, that blueprint and then, you know, use the wizard, go through, find all the options, right? Or if you'd rather pour through documentation and write it yourself, you can do that too, right? They're not mutually exclusive, which I think is great about the web console. Yeah, and obviously, because I talked about the role that exists for, you know, so there's a role that exists for a builder. There are a, a thousand options that exist. I could scroll for days. But if you're like me and you're lazy, you scroll to the bottom and find an example. If you notice, this looks very similar to the example that I've got. Obviously, I modified, you know, the usernames and variableized some pieces. But that's the beauty of Ansible. Every single role, every single module has an example for it. Beg, borrow, steal, modify. So I could start with this, go through the GUI and make the change and realize, all right, this is where the user stuff goes that I put in there. Here's where the services go to enable. Here's where the firewall specific services to enable are. Great, that simplifies the process. Take what you're comfortable with, take what someone else has done, combine the two and you're off and running. And now, because I've got this built out once, you know, hey, I wanna add in you know, a new package. Great, I just add in another line. Hey, I wanna add in another user. It makes that process so much easier to do. Once you've done it once, Okay, start simple. Don't make the most complex build that you've ever done with security profiles. Hey, this needs to be NIST compliant with these 15 different users and SSH keys. Please don't do that. You can, but don't. Start simple, start easy, take an easy process, run through it, build, and then you'd be surprised how quickly something like this turns into exactly your definition. And then, because this is all code, I can show the security team, hey, look, we're actually applying you know, this security profile as part of the big as part of the build. And I can like this has logs that show how that was provided. I can still rerun that as part of Ansible automation afterwards to ensure that that is still enforced today, a week from now, three weeks from now. But this makes that process much easier where I have a codified version of how I built it. And as Nate said, yes, troubleshooting, you know, kickstart and pixie boots are is always fun. Ansible is generally much easier to troubleshoot. The errors are a little bit easier to understand. And I can show the security team. Like if I show someone this, it's very clear. Here are the packages I'm installing. Here's the compose type. It's a lot easier for people to understand. And that's the beauty of, I don't need to be a RHEL expert. I don't need to be an image builder expert to understand how this process is actually being built and what it's doing. And I think that for me is the beauty of Ansible and image builder together for this process. So as a, as a systems administrator and a bit of an automation geek, this is like utopia and i'm going through this process here in my home lab where i'm updating a lot of my ansible playbooks that i've used at home for years to depend more on system roles instead of individually configuring subsystems on linux um but but what if i'm what if i'm uh what if i'm not an it guy what if i'm or sorry what if i'm not an ops guy what if i'm more of a developer or more of someone who just goes in and I've got a test book that I run 
to make sure that somebody else's work is is uh, is working. And I don't I don't want to deal with all the YAML code, uh, and uh, and I don't want to try and use Ansible automation platform and learn how that workflow works. Is is there a way that I could go in and just answer some questions and have that automation process kick off. Yeah. And that's kind of the nice thing of either a, I may not know or understand Ansible, the automation platform, but everything that I launched was through a survey. So I asked very basic questions and YAML took me some getting used to, I will admit for those who've never done it before, it's not like PowerShell or Java or anything like that, but everything that I'm doing through here has an API. So, because again, I can't help myself. I have service now that runs. I have a ServiceNow instance that can talk to my automation platform. So my my provisioning process that exists today, I as you know Nate throughout there, I may have three admins and a thousand people trying to do stuff. Well, I have a catalog that's available to them with specific surveys. Again, generic surveys if you're used to ServiceNow that ask very basic questions. You know, tag this device. How many of you have ever gone to an environment that doesn't have a tag? So I don't know if it's a dev system, a test system, or a prod system. Or I don't know who stood this up. I've got this the automation built out where it actually takes the service now user, auto adds that email as a tag. So anyone who ever provisions through this for through, through this service now instance, I know what type of server it is in terms of environment and who stood up. So if it's, you know, hey, this is running in Azure for three weeks, I can track them down so I stop spending money in Azure. So this entire process, and once I click, I'll, you know, why not? Let's demo it. So I'll just do, you know, I'll create an Alex server let's do let's do vmware why not and we'll do test did i ever log into the automation platform nope i just clicked order now and i hope things happen but because i like to again prove things that workflow has started this is a massive workflow this is the largest workflow i have built have used but as you know we kind of talked about with the pieces that go on after provisioning that's what this is and this isn't just rel because things go outside of just the rel portion this is if it's a prod system create a change request in service now and make sure it's approved before i go this is provisioning across three different hypervisors rel vmware azure with the user doesn't need to know what playbook is behind the scenes because i don't want to figure that out i handle that at my level and it picks the correct you know hypervisor to provision in with the correct information this is the, you know, hey, let's make sure it's actually registered to satellite and has the appropriate repos and all that. Deploy an application and hey, I need to talk to the load bouncer. Connect that because it's an application. It's a web application that I want. And, you know, tell me all the things. And I'm actually providing updates back to ServiceNow and emailing at the end of the day. So if I never logged into the automation platform or Ansible or knew a playbook, I would still get this in an automated fashion with updates back to this request as well as an email that says here is you know your system with here's the, the web link to the in my case the apache web server that's running and here's the link to the load balancer as it's written with zero understanding of yaml zero understanding of the variables that i have set the different hypervisors all that starts with one catalog item in service now and i will say like yes i understand this is a giant workflow that's honestly the scariest thing i've ever created but it started with one job and it was something that's like, hey, someone like Nate gives me a rel eight image. All right, let me get it set up, make sure it's actually registered and has the appropriate repos. Well, then I took the step back. I don't want to have to talk to Nate to get a new rel eight image. I want to build it myself. So I went back mm -hmm. and said, hey, let's provision it. And it just slowly expanded from there. And for me, that was the beauty of using Ansible for these pieces was I could start simple, pick the one thing that I didn't want to do or the one person that, hey, they were busy and they didn't have time to do this. And like, because this is all a workflow, as soon as one step finishes, it immediately goes to the next. So it's a mm -hmm. process that goes from one team to the other, to the other. So even if Nate's busy, if Justin's busy, I don't care. They could be the ones that wrote the playbooks. So it's using their expertise, but it just goes through the full process. And the end of the day, I've got a VM that's configured. And as far as the end user is concerned, I guarantee once they click this, they don't care what happens behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. They couldn't care less if it's Ansible, if it's some person on a wheel writing stuff. They just know, hey, I got my thing two weeks faster. I'm real happy. And then the security team's happy because they reviewed the process that, yeah, this actually does, installs auto mocks or whatever security tools we have. It enforces NIST compliance, whatever our compliance standards. They can say, yes, I know that's there because that's the playbook that's in version control that's always used. So it's like checking key. all those boxes. 
that's the key, right? Yep. Repeatability, right? Mm -hmm. I know this passes our compliance checklist, right? Because when you say the word compliance to certain people, they like fall into a seizure because it's like, ah, I have to do that every year. I have to deal with that. These, you know, they're so nitpicky, right? Well, if this build passes compliance, then the next build will pass compliance and the next build will pass compliance. As long as you don't change that. And if there's a change to the way things need to be compliant, you change it in the build, you make sure the build still passes compliance and off you go. Every build after that will be the same. I also want to point out something. We just proved the title of this episode, right? Like you don't get much simpler than that. And I love the fact mm -hmm. that Alex did all of this because as he said, he's not a real guy and he was able to do all of this. That's fantastic. Yeah, and I will never set up a pixie boot. It's never going to happen. But I could do all the other steps. I could write Ansible to call this hypervisor, that hypervisor, and it really kind of simplifies the process. And yes, compliance is scary. And if you want to get even scarier, you go to the idea of compliance as code. So I don't mm -hmm. have to worry about drift off my NIST compliance because I have a definition for, for I have RHEL 7 and RHEL 8. I haven't gotten to RHEL 9. I'm a little behind, but I have a definition for what- We need to have a conversation about that. Yeah, we'll, I'll fix that, don't worry. It's, it's coming down the line. I had to do the, the new automation platform first, but I have a definition for what NIST compliance means for me, because no one has ever said, I am 100% compliant on any compliance standard ever created. If they tell you that, they're lying to you because it's not possible. It physically is not possible. So define what it means to you. And now, hey, in a week, I just rerun that playbook. I schedule it to run every week and to email my security team so they get that warm, fuzzy feeling. It really makes that process a lot easier. And that's kind of the beauty of everything in some way as code. There are all kinds of buzzwords, compliance as code, infrastructure as code, DevOps as code, whatever you want to call it. But it basically is now I have a way to define exactly what my system looks like now, how I built it. And because I built it that way, I don't have to worry about drift. I just rerun that job. And all those packages are reapplied. All those repos are verified, enabled. All those security controls are also verified. So it really starts stitching all these different pieces together. So at the at the top of the uh, at the at the top of the show, I was kind of teasing out the episode about oh, this is something I am insanely passionate about. And in fact, before I got slurped up into the vendor world, I was literally I wasn't looking to go work for for GitLab and then eventually Red Hat. I was actually on the job market looking for a place where I could be what I would affectionately call an automation engineer, a Linux systems administrator that figures out that works insanely hard at not being a Linux systems engineer. <laughs> I wanted to be able to write playbooks. I, I got my start with, with salt stack, uh, and then d discovered the, the beauty of, of, uh, Ansible <gasps> and, uh, and how amazing that was. And, just the idea that it was so much easier to start that automation journey than I ever would have possibly imagined. So here in my home lab, it's like, I don't want to be a sysadmin at home. I'm a sysadmin all day at work. What can I do to fix that? Oh, that's easy. What's something that I do on a regular basis? I patch systems. Cool. Okay, let's write some automation that patches my system so I don't have to. Okay, what's something else that I do? Well, I never know when some crazy projects are going to pop up and it's like, I really want to play with that, but I don't want to take the two hours to download the newest rel ISO, spin up a virtual machine, run through the Anaconda installer. So how can I automate that process? Granted, when I started this, I didn't have a tool like image builder. Uh, we do now, and it does do code. <clears throat> and I can put that into a, a GitLab instance that I run here in my lab and I can make changes to it and I can test against it over and over and over again. And then that, that's how you get that momentum. You find, what what do I not like to do? What doesn't need my attention? What takes up a lot of time? What's something that's error prone? Just pick something, automate it. Take that time that you that you save by automating that task and go automate the next thing. And and like you said, Alex, you started out to to solve an issue, and now you've got this workflow that's as long as your monitor. But how much less do you have to do? Because now you can even go through you can even go through just a basically a survey that's simple enough that even Justin can figure it out. And, and within about four to five minutes, you'll have a VM. And if it's, if it's like my home lab, it's like, cool, I got a VM. Now I've, now I found the blog that outlines how you spin up XYZ products in a container 
uh, and now I'm going to now I've got Podman installed already. I'm going to I'm going to pull that container image, play with it. Ew, that is the worst UI I've ever seen, or this doesn't fit my workflow or something, and then delete that virtual machine, and it's done. It's gone. And you scale that out to a company that has tens of thousands of servers and multiple administrators. And then you expand that out to, I have a DBA that needs to test uh, a database upgrade, or I have a developer that is writing the application that our company is founded upon that we're required to keep moving and keep working to, so that the company actually continues to be profitable. And, <clears throat> and I just, I send them, I send them to, to service now and say, fill out the sheet with what you need. You'll have, you'll have an image. It'll have all of our compliance. It'll have all of the packages and it'll tie into our Active Directory, or our Identity Manager, whatever the case. Do your development there. And then when you're ready, we'll talk about moving it into staging, which you should have built into this process. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to add real fast, and it's really important to understand why this solution was chosen, is I wanted something that was modular, right? I imagine we show you a demo where we're deploying Apache. The realization should be that could be any application, right? So you develop this process, you figure out how it's supposed to work in your environment. And then later on, you get a requirement for a different application. You could reuse this process. This isn't something where you have to figure out how to rebuild the will on Azure versus AWS versus on-prem. It's something where you, you define it one time and then you make iterations upon it to improve. I think the- And, and a tool like Ansible and Ansible Automation Platform actually abstract that away for you. So what what- what one cloud provider may call a firewall, another one may call a VPC or something. That may be a poor example, but uh, it's just Eric picking out terms out of his head. Think uh, buzzwords. Run them together. Right. <laughs> right. Let, let, let me see if I can get somebody's bingo sheet knocked out. But uh, what, what one cloud provider may call XYZ, it might be ZYX on another cloud provider. Mm -hmm. But you put it into Ansible that I need access to this port, and Ansible does that translation. Where am I deploying? Okay, so that's this. So I need that API call, and it's done. You can you can deploy it anywhere. So I, I cut off Nate. So I want to want to give the the spotlight back to Nate. I was just going to say that uh, the important thing I think to remember when you're dealing with automation. Now I when I got started with automation, it was Puppet, right? And Puppet, I feel like you had to be at least half a Ruby developer in order to understand how to write Puppet. Um, so I always told myself, okay. It's painful to do this thing the first time, but every time after this is going to be simple, right? And generally that was true. With Ansible, even, even the it's painful to do it the first time isn't as true as it was in the puppet days, right? Because things have come along that far. Yes, people say about, you know, they give YAML a lot of crap because it's it's very picky about its formatting and how to how to do <laughs> things. But once you understand that and you have a grasp of how Ansible does things, you can churn out Ansible, in my opinion, relatively easily, right? And Alex, I mean, I don't know if, if you have more to say on that, but um, when I did my RHCE, I was dreading it because the, the, the version 8, as, as folks who've done it know, it's primarily an Ansible exam. Um, and I wasn't an Ansible guy when I came into it. But you know what? A week class, and I learned it, right? And I was able to pass it on the first shot. So that says something. If, if yeah. that was puppet, is, I'd, I'd have been like, what? No, if, I can't if do Nate this. Can, yeah. <laughs> well, Does that tell us that if Nate can pass, it's not difficult enough? Ooh. Is that the point you're making there? <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> well, and the other thing is, like, think of how many times you've, you've gone back and looked at your own script from a year ago and had no idea what you did. Mm -hmm. Like, I like the, as Eric was kind of talking, he was going back through his playbooks. I Because I started with Ansible way before collections and all those things came out. I was able to refactor everything because I can look at it and understand. And I like I could share this to Justin and to Nate. That's the beauty of Ansible is like those examples make sense because I can look at it and know what it's doing. Like that's how I've written automation for networking and for cloud. Do I could I run a command on a networking device to update a VLAN? Zero percent chance. But I know automation and I know a module conveniently named VLAN with hey, here are the VLANs and here's the ID and here's the name from. That's very easy to understand. So it can make these things a lot easier to do all kinds of pieces and it can be everything from deploying because I saw someone throw Prometheus in there. I have Prometheus in my lab. I actually used Ansible to deploy Prometheus, deploy, deploy Grafana, deploy the Prometheus node exporter. And because I threw this out there before with 2.4, you could get extra creative 
And I could add in event-driven Ansible to automatically respond to the alerts that Alert Manager gets, because conveniently there's an Alert Manager source. So easy one. Hey, node exporter, stop working. Restart it. Done. Mm -hmm. And then expand that, from there. Again, start simple, then grow. That is the nirvana that we've been promised since automation hit the scene, right? That you can have your auto oh, you can sure. have you can automate alerts from your from your alerting system to trigger jobs in your automation system, right? So common issues that happen that wake you up at two in the morning and the solution is just to hit a button, right? You can have the automation do that for you. And then it doesn't page you in, unless that didn't work, right? So every sysadmin should listen to that. If you hear nothing else. <laughs> yeah, do you like getting called Saturday at 2 a.m.? No, here you go. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, you've got things like uh, Ansible Automation Platform. You've got event-driven Ansible on, on its way into, into, uh, into the public hands. And then something uh, that's on the near horizon is something like Ansible Lightspeed, which is basically... I hate to use the term because it's so conflated and overused, but it's it's basically an AI engine to help you write Ansible. The difference between something like Lightspeed and ChatGPT is Ansible or uh, is yeah is Lightspeed is very very focused. It's got a very spectrum, very small spectrum of knowledge that it's interested in, and that is just Ansible, just Ansible playbooks and writing them well, and so. Ansible Lightspeed is going to help solve that issue. You can type in a task and say, install Apache HTTPD and hit enter and give it a few seconds and it'll spit out all the YAML code you need to do that task. So you, you tie that in with, with event-driven Ansible and now you're not so much a Linux systems administrator as you are occasionally writing a new module and a new playbook while you're playing Halo 3. You become, yeah. you become a bot herder is what you're saying. <laughs> One thing I want to bring up real fast, and this is something I think is extremely important to get across, is this is not just a parlor trick, right? This solves a mm -hmm. real business need. And it absolutely is something that you can build off of and get better at. So like, it's, it's absolutely worth the time. It's absolutely worth the investment. And I, I really recommend people take a look at it because I come from a background where you have to see it to believe it, right? The fact that we can demo this, the fact that we can provide you the code, the fact that you can see it and try it out yourself gives a lot of credence to what we're saying. And I want you to have the capabilities to be able to talk about this with other people. Yeah. And again, don't boil the ocean day one. Pick something mm -hmm. simple. Start there. Like, yeah. Pick a, a task. Yeah. Pick a task. A, as Eric said, the thing that you hate. Automate that and then start going from there. Because if you pick this super complex use case that's going to take you six months to figure out a, how you how people do it today and then automate it, you're so far behind. A, everything I automate, every task, well, that's more time I get back to automate that next thing. So all of a sudden I start getting more time to write that automation to do all those other pieces. And that's kind of the beauty of stitching these things together. And maybe I get myself some more sleep. So I don't get woken yeah, up pick, at random hours. What's, what's that? Pick the thing, pick the thing you have to do everywhere is my advice, right? Like everyone uses NTP as their first example. Well, there's a reason for that. It's because every server cares about time, right? So it's applicable to anything you deploy. So take that example, deploy it to your fleet. Boom. Now you have, now your short time is synchronized everywhere. Okay. Well, that's your gateway now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I have an idea how this thing works. What about, you know, the next big thing that I care about? What about my automation user? What about, you know, anything pick a compliance task pick a package that you like to have installed on every server that you have right things like that agents that need to be deployed for security compliance or i keep using security compliance as an example because that's the thing i know everybody hates <laughs> um one other thing i'll say as well is i've talked to a lot of developers and i used to ask the question what's the difference between like a brand new developer and someone that's very experienced it's been around for a while and the point that they like to make out is the fact that they have a lot more content already built, right? They've already built mm -hmm. it and they can reuse it and repurpose it. That's absolutely the beauty of this particular solution is you can customize it however you need to. In fact, one of the things I'd love to be able to talk about at some point is the idea that we talk to partners. We talk to people that are deploying their own application and help them come up with their own image. So this isn't something we put a dependency on our customers to figure out how to do. So 
I we we could go on for hours about this topic, and I'm I'm trying to figure out how to take my take this vision of uh, automation and and building out an automation practice. I'm I don't know if it's a blog series, a video series, if it's if it's a talk, I'll give it a conference. I'm trying to figure out how to how to capture all the pain that all of us have felt getting paged out at 2 a.m. and couple that with just the sheer joy of like Nate said fixing your your time sync issue across your fleet with just six lines of yaml code i mean just just that night and day difference i'm i'm trying to figure it out if anybody has any ideas just you know shoot me a tweet or or a mastodon message or whatever um but the one thing that it has gotten me excited to do is i i told myself at the beginning of 2023 that i was going to go get my rhce and i was actually i i took it a few years not well not a few years back good grief like 11 years ago and missed it by about three points and was so devastated that I just never went back to try and take it again. But when I found out that nowadays it's more Ansible based, I was like that. I know I bet I could spend a couple of weeks and go and take my RACE exam. And uh, so, so this conversation has kind of re-inspired me. I actually have the lab, uh, the lab guide uh, for my red hat learning subscription over on, uh, uh, over on my my iPad, it's just waiting for me to take some time to learn it. So thank you guys for re-inspiring me to to go out and pursue this concept of automation. Uh, if you are interested in more content, be sure to check out uh, the Summit catalog. You can go to red.ht/summit to find all that information. Or if you're interested about things like RHEL 9 or the OpenSCAP uh, compliance features within Image Builder, brand new in 9.2, stay tuned to this channel because we've got content every single week. We've got things like uh, Image Builder. We've got security compliance. We've got cloud conversations. We've got a jam-packed schedule this summer. So while, uh, while the kids may be out of school, we're all still in school learning how to do all of this uh, so we can come, come and show you all that uh, on a live stream. Um, so definitely check out the show notes here in about an hour or so uh, for chapter markers and some additional resources. Uh, Justin, Alex, thank you guys so much for joining me. Um, Nate, Ms. Mr. Uh, Mr. ITT host here, you want to tease out uh, this week's episode of Into the Terminal? Oh, right. So uh, last week we showed you guys how to build RPMs from custom code, right? So you could package your own stuff up. This week, we're going to talk about how you take all those RPMs and put them into repositories so that you can then easily install them on your systems. So tune in Friday at noon Eastern. We'll be talking about repositories and all the stuff that goes with it. Yep, Nate and Scott will be live to talk about that Friday at noon Eastern. I'll be in the chat and doing behind-the-scenes producery things and making fun of Nate on the stream to see if I can derail his presentation, as I usually do. Um, and this show, jam-packed schedule, we've got a conversation coming up in two weeks where we're going to be talking about how do you port your workloads over from something like CentOS Linux to Red Hat Enterprise Linux on AWS. So we were talking a lot about clouds today. We're going to keep talking about clouds for a little bit. Um, and then uh, in two weeks or in two episodes from now, we've got Matthew Miller, the Fedora project lead, going to be joining us talking about what uh, Fedora has been up to the last year or so. Uh, and then uh, and I already teased that we'll be talking about image builder uh, compliant images. Uh, that was a talk I gave at Summit uh, this past year that we wanted to bring in here. We'll probably have Mr. Terry Bowling join us. He is our product manager for image builder and a frequent flyer on this show. So so much content and we've we've got I, I know nate and i've got some tech tip videos that are in final editing and reviews so if if you want to grab all this content hit the subscribe button hit that hit that bell um it's, it's funny we're, we're told as hosts we have to tell you guys to do this but go click the notification bell click the bell that way you get notified when we go live or anytime new content is published tons of content put it in the comments if you're curious uh about a particular topic or how to do something we'd love to take your idea turn it into some content and send that back your way we definitely check those comments uh, a couple of times a day so thank you all for joining us on behalf of justin and alex my our guest today nate my co-host and on behalf of the entire red hat enterprise linux team thank you all for joining us for episode 60 of red hat enterprise linux presents i cannot believe I think I've been on the show for about 41 episodes now. So that's just crazy, crazy 60 episodes of Rail Presents. And we're still going strong. Tons of content coming your way. And we'll see you all on Friday. Thank you. Thanks for watching, folks. <laughs>